There is a constant search for life on other planets. What does the Bible say about extraterrestrial life? The following lecture by Francois is part two on the cosmos. Enjoy it. You are looking at a picture of the Earth taken from one of the satellites that orbit our planet. You and I are somewhere on this big planet. But what about the other planets? Are they inhabited by human beings? This is the moon's surface. For many centuries we've been studying this fascinating neighbor of ours, searching for signs of life. You know, when I was a little boy, they told me there was a man living up there. And then not so long ago, human beings from planet Earth paid a visit to the moon. What a scientific breakthrough. But they did not find any trace of life on the moon. The man in the moon was gone. They expected meters upon meters of moon dust, but only found a few millimeters when they landed. Subsequently, the estimated age of the moon is no longer millions of years, but somewhere between six and 10,000 years. After the spatial conquering of the moon, scientists and astronauts decided to visit a little deeper into our solar system. And this is what one of the Voyager missions brought back, a picture of Jupiter taken from a distance of 1.2 million kilometers. They call this part Ganymede, but found no life. They took this picture of Uranus, but found no life. They also discovered that the planets take on different shades of colors at different times, but they did not discover any form of life. But what about the great beyond? There are millions of galaxies with their countless billions of huge suns. And around each sun you have orbiting planets. Do we have a lifeless universe out there? While you're looking at one of the hundred million galaxies, let me read a statement by Harold Spencer Jones. Can it be that throughout the vast deeps of space, nowhere but on our own little earth is life to be found. This comes from his book, Life on Other Worlds, page 19. Dr. Russell Crawford, director of Students Observatory, Berkeley, California, USA, writes, To me, it is the smallest thought imaginable to think that this speck of cosmic dust is the only place in the universe that is inhabited by intelligent beings. Dr. Campbell, formerly of Lick Observatory, adds, Probably we could not point our finger in any direction and miss the truth if we said there was some form of life in that direction. This wonder of the deep skies is the spiral galaxy of Cephas. Professor Butler of Sydney University wrote these words in the Daily Telegraph, February 17, 1960. It can be said with reasonable accuracy that there are some tens and possibly some hundreds of thousands of millions of planets in our own galaxy alone which are capable of supporting life. I think this astronomer has got a point. What do you say? Isaiah 45, 18 comes out with a supporting statement. For this is what the Lord says, He who created the heavens... He is God. He who fashioned and made the earth, he founded it. He did not create it, that's the heavens and the earth, to be empty, but formed it to be inhabited. He says, I am the Lord, and there is no other. What a thought. A personal God said he did not create an impersonal universe. There is life out there. A powerful telescope picked up this galaxy in outer space. It's millions of light years away from us. Ephesians 3, 14 and 15 has this enlightening information. Paul says, For this reason I kneel before the Father, from whom the whole family in heaven and on earth derives its name. What a thought! We are part of a huge cosmic family. Nehemiah 9.6 comes out with a similar thought. 
You alone are the Lord. You made the heavens, even the highest heavens, and all their starry host, the earth and all that is on it, the seas and all that is in them. You give life to everything, and the multitudes of heaven worship you. Are other worlds inhabited? The Bible says, yes, they are. And these multitudes worship God. In other words, they are unfallen, sinless human beings. Do you think they are aware of us? Paul says so. I'm reading from 1 Corinthians 4 verse 9. We have been made a spectacle, the Greek says theatron, theater, to the whole universe, to angels as well as to men. This means that the inhabited planets in the great galaxy of Andromeda in M31 watch us. I like the way the Jerusalem Bible translated this verse. We have been put on show in front of the whole universe, angels as well as men. Job 1 verse 6 and 7 One day the angels came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came with them. The Lord said to him, Where have you come from? Satan answered the Lord, From roaming through the earth and going to and fro in it. The sons of God, as some translations put it, are the representatives of the unfallen worlds. Adam was supposed to be at this council, but through disobedience he lost it and Satan became the illegitimate representative. Revelation chapter 12 verse 12 says, Therefore rejoice, you heavens, and you who dwell in them. Why should the people of unfallen worlds rejoice? Because the devil and his angels have been cast out of heaven. Everything returned to normal. But the verse continues and says, But woe to the earth and the sea, because the devil has gone down to you. He is filled with fury, because he knows that his time is short. Like all the other planets, God gave this one all that was needed to live an eternal life of usefulness and happiness. But what do we find today? We are living on the most unhappy, unsafe and unfriendly planet in God's great universe. When Adam sinned and fell, this entire planet sinned and fell with him. Let's briefly consider the four great gifts God gave us in the beginning. Genesis 2.7 And the Lord God formed man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living being. He did not receive a soul, he became a living soul. What a gift, the gift of life. And the Creator wanted His creatures to continually improve the quality of their lives. God wanted man to live on forever. He did not intend that even a flower petal should fade and die. What a kind, generous, loving Creator. Let's look at the second gift. Genesis 1.26 Then God said, Let us make man in our image, in our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air, over the livestock, over all the earth, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. The second gift was a sinless, righteous character. Ecclesiastes 7.29 says, God made man upright. Originally, no one had any hang-ups. Do you have hang-ups? Adam and Eve had no complexes, no guilt feelings, no phobias. They were made in the image of their Creator. It was easy for them to get along with themselves and with one another. Do you have a problem with yourself and with others? The third gift was paradise. Genesis 2.8 Now the Lord God planted a garden in the east in Eden, and there he put the man he had formed. It's impossible for us to imagine just what that first home was like. Constant, even temperature, no pollution, no rates and taxes, no need for electricity. The blue heavens were its dome, the earth with its delicate flowers and carpet of living green was its floor. 
and the leafy branches of the goodly trees were its canopy. Its walls were hung with the most magnificent adorning, the handiwork of the great master artist. This comes from the book Patriarchs and Prophets, page 49. What a home! The third gift was dominion over the entire unblemished planet. What a fantastic gift! How would you react if God gave you a planet as a gift? You know, we serve an extravagant God. Genesis 2 verse 28, God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air, and over every living creature that moves on the ground. And their rulership also included the king of the beasts, the lion. Adam and Eve, said the Lord, this planet with all its wealth and potential is yours. It's a gift. Enjoy it. This is how we started out. But it's so different today. What went wrong? How did man lose these four precious treasures? They had free access to all the fruit trees in the garden, but they were forbidden to eat from just one of the trees. Why? To develop the power of choice. God wants us to choose to worship and obey Him. Without choice, there could be no character development. By obeying God, they manifested their love for Him. Genesis 2.17 But you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat of it, you will surely die. Genesis 3.19 For dust you are, and to dust you will return. Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death. One of the saddest consequences of disobedience is separation. We should be extremely careful when we make a decision. My choice may affect many other people. Romans 5.12 Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man, and death through sin, and in this way death came to all men, because all sinned. Through disobedience we lost the most precious gift, the gift of life. Romans 3.10-12 tells us that we also lost our righteous character. The following verse is a shocking psychoanalysis of our own sinful state, but I want to read it to you. It says, There is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands, no one who seeks God. All have turned away. They have together become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. Romans 3 verses 10 to 12. We look so good on the outside, but we are so rotten on the inside. This is what we inherited from Adam. Genesis 3.23 So the Lord God banished him from the Garden of Eden to work the ground from which he had been taken. Have you perhaps lost your home, your physical home, your marital home, or your spiritual home? These losses are all consequences of Adam's sin as well as our own sin. And the last original gift we lost was the gift of control. We are no longer in control, but are being controlled. 2 Peter 2 verse 19 They promise them freedom, while they themselves are slaves of depravity. For man is a slave to whatever has mastered him. I remember the first time I visited a leper hospital in Malawi, at a mission called Malamula, which means the law of God. I was shocked at what I saw. But you and I have another kind of leprosy, the leprosy of a sin-infected nature. For a few Italian liras, you can visit the prison where Paul was jailed. The closer this man came to Christ, the more he realized what a wretched man he was. I'm reading from Romans 7 verse 24. What a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body of death? Have you ever felt that way? You're looking at the ancient ruins of Ephesus. This is where Paul labored for quite some time. 
And this is also where the young pastor Timothy labored for many years. On one specific day here at Ephesus, Timothy received a personal letter from Paul. I'm just going to read one verse. It's from 1 Timothy 1.15. Here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst. As I walked through the ruins, I thought of Paul's words. He had an enlightened knowledge of man's real sinful condition. When you look at the perfect holiness of Christ, you realize how very sinful you are. Like John on the Isle of Patmos, the prophet Isaiah also had a vision of the Lord. He had angels singing, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. Isaiah 6, 3. But listen to the prophet's reaction in verse 5. Woe to me, I cried. I'm ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live amongst the people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. If ever there was a good and righteous man in my estimation, then it was the prophet Daniel. The Lord revealed to him all the secrets of the future, and he saw our day. But how did Daniel view himself? I want to read you one of his prayers. It's found in Daniel chapter 9, verses 4 and 5. O Lord, the great and awesome God, who keeps his covenant of love with all who love him and obey his commands, we have sinned and done wrong. We have been wicked and have rebelled. We have turned away from your commands and laws. He was such a godly man, the lions wouldn't even eat him. Yet he realized that he, with the rest of mankind, is in a sinful, fallen state. His prayer is one of repentance. The reason why there are so many self-righteous people is because they have not seen the king in his beauty. When I compare myself to someone a little more wicked than myself, I feel good. But when I stand in front of God's holy law, that is a transcript of his perfect character, I sense my hopeless lostness. And with Paul I cry out, What a wretched man I am! Who will rescue me from this body of death? What can you and I do to be saved? What does the Father expect from us? Perfect obedience to all his commandments. And perfect obedience implies a perfect obedience from childbirth till the day I die. Perfect obedience means that I never ever experienced emotions of hatred or lust or jealousy or whatever sinful emotions there may be. Tell me, do you qualify for heaven? I don't. And then the devil whispers in my ear, Man, the law of God is done away with, don't worry. It's nailed to the cross. Or he tells people, try harder. If you try hard enough, you will please God and because of your good performances, he will save you. Is this what he tells you? Don't believe him, he's a liar. There is only one way for you and me to get to heaven, and that is the Jesus way. John 14 verse 6 says, He is the way, the truth, and the life. When Adam sinned, the entire human race also sinned. In Adam, we are all lost. Why? Because Adam represents all mankind. But you say that's not fair. You would be right if it wasn't for the fact that Jesus came as the second Adam, a new representative of the human race. 1 Corinthians 15.22 says, For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. What a fantastic good offer. Because of Adam people die, but because of the second Adam, Jesus Christ, there is hope of a resurrection. So cheer up. Because of Jesus, the second Adam, we all have hope to live again. 
I'm reading the following good news from 1 Corinthians 15 verse 45. The first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam, that is Christ, a life-giving spirit. Are you interested in this life-giving spirit? I am. Verse 47 says, The first man was of the dust of the earth, the second man from heaven. This is the wonderful good news. When the first representative of the human race failed, God sent a second one, his own son, and he succeeded. Every time I visit Bethlehem, I'm choked with emotions because it was here that the creator of a trillion sons became a helpless babe in the arms of an inexperienced young woman. John 1 verse 14 The word became flesh and lived for a while among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. The Word, Jesus Christ, who spoke galaxies into existence and caused them to glow in all their brilliance, became a lowly human being. Where the first Adam fell, he came and gained the victory for you and me. Matthew 1.21 She will give birth to a son and you are to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. I want to tell you something incredible. When Jesus was born at Bethlehem, you and I were born in him. It was here that you and I got a new start in Christ. Not far from the church of nativity in Bethlehem are the shepherds' fields where they watch their flocks on that specific night of Christ's birth. Concerning the announcement of this great event, I read from Luke 2, verses 13 and 14. Suddenly a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to men on whom his favor rests. For the first time since the fall of Adam, God the Father was again pleased with mankind in the person of his Son. For the first time since Adam, his favor rested again on man. Jesus grew up as a perfect, sinless youth, teenager and young person. He never disobeyed his parents. He never sulked. He never refused to do his duty. My young friend, if you accept Jesus Christ as your representative, then you have never sinned because Jesus never sinned. As an adult, he was always courteous. He never insulted people and he never lost his temper. He never broke a heart and he never allowed any sinful thought to enter his mind. Jesus was perfect in every respect. I have good news for you, my adult friend. In Christ, we have never broken a heart. We have never sinned. Listen to this marvellous verse of scripture in Romans 5.19. For just as through the disobedience of one man the many were made sinners, so also through the obedience of the one man, that's Christ, the many will be made righteous. This is the good news of the gospel. In the first Adam we are all condemned and lost. But God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world. In the second Adam, you and I have all the righteousness necessary to be saved. How do I receive this perfect life of Jesus Christ? How can I appropriate this life? Ephesians 2 verse 8 For it is by grace that you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. You cannot earn a gift. You can only accept it with a grateful heart and say, Thank you, thank you, thank you. When Adam transgressed the law of God, he had to receive the penalty. And what was the penalty? Death. Which death? The first one that the Bible calls asleep, or the second one without a resurrection. 
If it was not for Christ, the second Adam, and neither Adam nor we would have had hope or a resurrection. What exactly happened at Calvary at the skull, as the Bible calls this hill? The penalty of Adam's sin was delayed till Friday afternoon at three o'clock. Instead of the first Adam, the second Adam got onto the cross and received the penalty for the transgression of the law. The penalty was eternal death, eternal separation from God the Father. When Jesus died on Calvary, he died the agonies of the second death. He said goodbye to life and to the Father, not for three days, but in quality for eternity. Isaiah 53 verse 5 says, But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. You and I have transgressed the law. The penalty is eternal death. How can we escape this terrible punishment? Let me read you one of the most dramatic verses of Scripture. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 14 For Christ's love compels us because we are convinced that one died for all and therefore all died. What a message! When Jesus Christ died on Calvary, you and I died with him. The entire human race was in their representative, the second Adam, when he died. When Christ received the penalty of the second death, I also received that penalty in him. This is the good news of the gospel. The law says you must die because you've transgressed it. But now you can say to the law that you did die when Christ died. The law requires perfect obedience. This is no problem. In Jesus Christ you have lived that perfect life. Paul says in Galatians 2 verse 20, I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God. Wouldn't you also like to say that you too have been crucified with Christ? Can you tell me what happened to us when Christ was raised from the tomb, ascended to heaven and was seated on the right hand of the Father? Listen to this good news from Ephesians 2 verse 6. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. All that was lost by the first Adam, the second Adam called Jesus Christ, brought back. If you want eternal life, a perfect character, dominion and an eternal home, you may have it in Christ. In the beautiful little book called Steps to Christ, page 68, it says, In the matchless gift of his Son, God encircled the whole world with an atmosphere of grace, as real as the air which circulates the globe. All who choose to breathe this life-giving atmosphere will live and grow up to the stature of men and women in Christ Jesus. Would you like to live? Then all you have to do is to breathe God's grace that encircles you right now. I invite you to breathe this breath of life and live. Thank you, Francois. Friends, if we are faithful, we will have the privilege of visiting other unfallen worlds. But we will be the only ones that can witness of Christ our Redeemer as we have had the experience of sin and its terrible consequences. I am looking forward to a trip into the universe. How about you? Let us pray. Father in heaven, my prayer for everyone listening right now is that they will make sure their heavenly passports are in order. Speak to every heart through your Holy Spirit. This is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.